Thanks. I'm happy you're here. Thanks, darling. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming on this balmy, beautiful night. Um, mm. You know, I have I have questions. <laughs> I, I came prepared, but I, I do too. I've got some for you as well. Really? Oh yeah. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> I was about to say that I'm having a bit of a vulnerability hangover. Okay, yep. From yesterday, where I got a little bit excited about stuff in a public forum. Ah, I've not been reading the news. What happened? <laughs> no, I was just in Sydney and we were at yeah. this thing and I was with Melly and, and, and there was this thing and it was a business thing. And there were lots of serious business people yep, in yep, the room. Yep. yep. But it was at the Sydney Opera House. Okay, got so it. So I got a little bit confused and I thought I was with theatre peeps. Yeah. And I got up to the microphone and I just was <laughs> open and, you know, Did you start honest. with dear people of the theatre? <laughs> Did you? No, I, I, were you very like? Okay, so you're no, open. I was just open and sort of honest and authentic and it was in a business context got and it. I was like, yeah, and I was there and I kind of teared up but I stopped myself and I was a bit, and then, and, oh, and who, then el who else, can I just, who, who has ever had this feeling? Who has ever had this feeling of just giving a little to, like, it's no. like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like when you go, you know, we've been together now seven years and I think it's time that I, I let you know, I think I'm in love with you. And they look at you like, what? Seven years, I thought we were just casual. <laughs> that is the feeling, isn't it? But what a relief it is for someone like me to have perhaps been sitting in the audience to see a woman like you do that. What a relief it is. And I'm so tired of the consciousness that says that business has nothing to do with heart and that you know, making money has nothing to do with social good and that professionalism is about coldness. It just doesn't sit well with me, it never did. Well, we were watching this incredible film <coughs> called Frackman, which hasn't been released yet, but it's about coal seam gas drilling into the water table in Australia and the impact that that's gonna have on uh, um, communities around Australia, but on Australia as a whole. And it was this pitching thing and I was talking about exactly that. I was talking about, you know, I got up to the microphone and said, you know what? Business can be good for the planet, good for people, and make a profit. They're not mutually exclusive. And I teared up. And then I, I was fine about it on the day, but this morning I went, oh, oh, <laughs> Jesus. I didn't need to do that in front. And I there was someone very serious from the business world who came up to me afterwards and just kind of, you know, was <clears throat> about it and, it, like, interested, but it was uncomfortable. So it, yeah. it's about... He was just trying not to cry. Was <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it is about what you're doing with Big Hearted Business, and I really wanted Thanks, to ask Lee. you about that. What sure. do you mean when you're talking about Big Hearted Business, mm -hmm. about Whole Hearted Business? Mm -hmm. I have no idea where the term came from. Mm. I just know that I have always had a different relationship to business than the one that I was brought up understanding was correct. Um, and I realised this really early. I realised this on my first day of studying an undergrad degree. Um, I went to a school called Press Hill. Has any, any of you heard, heard, it, heard, it, heard of it? Yeah, it's a kind of pretty free progressive school. I actually went from the Catholic girls' school then to Ooh. Press Hill, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Throw the sea, anyone? <laughs> Woo! Testify! <laughs> Represent, <laughs> ladies! Yeah, badass. Jermaine Greer went there, so, so did Nikki Buckley. Anyway, <laughs> she seems like a really nice lady, but they're pretty different um, in terms of <laughs> career choice. So, um, here's what happened. I went to Press Hill and there wasn't much careers counselling and I ticked a box and I said, I, I always knew I wanted to save the world, always knew. This ambitious, ridiculous notion that somehow little old me could do something useful. Imagine that, what a crazy thought, <laughs> really. Um, I ticked a box and, and so, so it was that my decision to change the world um, meant that I, I st studied <coughs> Public relations at RMIT. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally lasted about one week, and I tell this story often, until the, 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 the lovely lady who I believe went to a school called Mandeville came up to me and she said, 
you know, it's really amazing because you seem really nice, but like a lot of us are wondering if you're in the wrong class. <laughs> and this is the response I got again and again. Okay, now I was someone who always loved working from the age of 13, I had a job, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, but I had this very unusual thing which is that every month, and this, I don't know that I've told anyone this before, but because you're here, I will say it. So every month I had the most ridiculously painful periods, which meant I would have to take four days off work. I was throwing up and kind of really unwell. <laughs> and there's something about that that made me understand I needed to run my own business. I needed to be the boss. I needed to be able to take time off for life. I really did. You know, I literally <laughs> was so sick of calling in sickies. So I dropped out of PR and I had the good fortune to start Creative Arts. Yep. And I decided that I was going to be courageous around the things that I hated, which was business. I hated the thought that I would be criticised as an artist. I hated the thought that I would be... Um, that I would undermine this gift that I had musically with, with the music industry, but the music industry changed. <laughs> and I realised that those who I admired, who were prospering, were independent thinkers, creating their own models in an environment that allowed it, which meant we had technology now. The gatekeepers had changed. Yeah. The gatekeeper now was me and you, the audience. I didn't have to go through the big boy. And so I made some decisions about business. I thought, I'm never going to work with people I don't admire or like. I'm always going to put people before profit. Uh, I wonder if this will fucking work. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere along the line, uh, I met other people who did the same and this feeling of big hearted business, mentoring other creative people to do the same, started happening and 10 years later, we formalised it. Hmm. I had no idea the idea would take the way it has um, and connect the way it has. I had no idea that you were doing what you were doing very... <laughs> so just a small aside, which is an important one, Barry and I went to uni together. And I really liked her, and, but we never had much time to, to chat. And so the delight of thinking, oh, I've got this really weird idea, I wonder if anyone will like it. It's about doing business with heart, doing business. I mean, why business is connected to life. Why is it different? I need to make a living. Why don't I do it with my values intact? Why don't I do it by making music that's good? Why don't I do it that, by having a message? Why don't I do it by setting a good example for my kids? You know, that was really the line in the sand, having the kids really suddenly and magically going, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Better get off the doll. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I did a small business course. Barry and I went to school together, so when we launched Big Harder Business two years ago with a possible campaign, and we got back in contact, the rel again, the relief for me, of knowing that you existed and that you were using your mind f for a similar idea, this idea of interconnectedness, like it's basic. When we die, you're going to be going down the tunnel going, oh, yeah, we were all connected after all. <laughs> or else you, you know, I mean, I've never taken drugs that do that, but that's what they <laughs> say happens, you know. <laughs> anyway, so it sounds like a hippie ideal, but in fact, it's just science. I, you know, I'm drinking a cup. Where does the wood come from? Where does the coffee come from? Who were the people who made that coffee? How was it grown? How were they paid? Was there an environmental curiosity or interest or care in that, in that chain? Is there more than money? God, we've got to make money. I love money. Look at me, I've got a freaking Prada handbag. You know, like I'm, I'm not shy about money. It was a gift, actually. I didn't buy it. I'd never buy it. <laughs> But actually, they're interesting, they're interesting topics, aside from the idea of business as, as a force for good in the world, which you know I'm incredibly passionate about That's and right. have a vulnerability hangover over. Um, I love that you did that, though, and thanks for sharing it straight up, too. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I'll back you up. Yeah. Is it bitch, she knows yeah. what she's talking yo, about. Yo, yo. <laughs> um, I guess I said it because when I see you performing, you have such a gift and it also reminds me of The Wild Woman, that idea, that, so, that book I was given as a gift by um, a beautiful friend, reminding us about so much spirit that's been lost, the things that we can, you're right, that we can um, build, we can redesign the DNA of business. Yeah. And I know that's resonated unbelievably with the big hearted business community. And um, does everyone understand exactly how that works too? Why are we talking about the fact that you can reinvent the model of business in this day and age? It's really straightforward, but again, it's just that concept of audience. 
Every good business is based on solving a problem. That's how we make money. When you get, you know, a great idea that does good in the world and you get the ability to solve a problem and they go together like that, in the middle is your big heart of business or your, you know, socially aware business. But and how do you do that mm -hmm. and still be you? Like, how do you authentically... How do you do that without being you? How can you do it without being you? This was my decision. I cannot wear... I have, I have a, this, this is me at the start of my music career. I was so scared of the record industry. I thought they were all evil. Mm. So they were all evil. I had so much judgment, so much wrong judgment mm. actually about good people who work in music and there are lots of them. That I allowed that to dictate, you know, staying in a small box for a long time until I went, I'm now a mother I actually don't have time to dress like that. I don't want to take off my clothes in film, in film clips and et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I want to talk about things that matter. I don't want a script. Um, I can't be bothered being anything other than myself. It's too hard. I mean, check out the character playing Offspring. She wears my dresses. Like, she's a red-headed musician. Pretty lazy, really. <laughs> <laughs> Every role I ever play is the same. So my thing is, how can, you, how, how can we not? I mean, we can only keep up a facade for so long. We can only keep it up for so long, so, you know. So it's, a lot of people have asked me the same question about you, which I found really interesting, and um, I had to write it down, but a lot of people have said to me that you seem to have it so together. Right. <laughs> Perception versus reality. Can what are you saying? Can of course I, I have it all together. <laughs> I totally have it all together. Well, you know, I think that we you do... You just went cross-eyed because you were lying. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got it all together, yeah. Sure. Comparison. We've talked about it. Comparison yes. is the death of happiness. I love and, you for and saying that. I love you. And uh, just, I think that's a really powerful thing, though, to see someone who's incredibly well known, who's on TV, who's singing like you sing, who's getting up there with all that bravery and strength and wild womanness. Um, and I just can't play the other role. I couldn't keep it up. If I could be Miranda Kerr, I might have been. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I was born with that dimple, maybe I was. But what is the point of playing a role that's not us? You know, how, 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 how I mean, you guys know this. We're gonna, you're gonna have time for questions, by the way. This not yes, gonna... there's time for questions. But how, <coughs> Can we not be? It's like we are constantly in. Pro Nobody's perfect, of course. Nobody I've ever met is perfect. I've met most, many of my heroes, and I was hoping, dear God, please make one of them perfect. <laughs> and none of them are. They're all incredibly human, and thank goodness for that. And that's a relief. So finding out that freed me up. So that's one thing. Number two. Um, understanding the impact of the music when you start getting the letters back from people. That's another thing. Number three, being a crier. Number four... What do you mean about being a crier? So, being a crier, you know, like I can't... You know, I can't... Um, I'm, I turn red in the face talking about what I think of. You know, I, I sweat with passion for it. I almost drool. I, you know, I get, I get so... Um, I'm so on the surface, and I always have been. Mm. You know, I haven't had one of these sort of petite lives. There's nothing about my life that's been that way. Mm. So when I'm a crier, it means I feel stuff. It's right on the surface. And I tried for many years to hide that. You know, I really did. I mean, I'm not talking to someone who's, <laughs> you know, I was born realising I just had to be Mary. It wasn't like that for me. It, you know, my sister was a model. I, dieted right through my teens. I still struggle with my physicality, being a woman who's in the public eye, who isn't a, a stick. Like, that's still deeply challenging for me. And, and I, I say that out loud because I know I'm not the only one. It doesn't matter if you're in public or you're in private. You know, we all have these criticisms. And your question again was, <laughs> oh, crier. It was actually. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You know what? I think I'm actually asking you about being really strong and uh -huh. being really brave yeah. and being able to fail. So funny. I just don't feel either. I feel, I feel I, the failing bit is good. <laughs> the bravery is, a, I mean, it's very, um, 
you know, I hear that description of me and it's just, I feel so, I've, I've only started, I feel so at the beginning of my good work in the world. Hmm. I feel like a baby, I feel like I've done nothing. Thanks, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you too. I think we all do. And if I let that voice paralyse me, I would not have come tonight. And, uh, you know, I'm shocked that this many people in a room listen. I'm not... I yeah. saw your shock when we came up the stairs. Claire, yeah. Claire went, that sounds like a lot of people. <laughs> and I was like, shit, sorry. There's <laughs> like, right. No, but that sense of... The love of the magazine draws us together. The love of ideas, the love of people who are courageous, who really are courageous. And staying connected, you seem to... I, I'm here, what I'm hearing you talk about is that if you stay connected... Yep. <gasps> yes. So making a real point of, 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 of finding other people who are a bit like you in the world. So, real life. Real life. Yeah. I reckon one of the things that ha there, there, there's, there are things that happen to all of us in our lives, as we said before. So I've never met anyone who didn't have a bit of suffering, a bit of pain. I've certainly never, ever, ever been to a dinner party or fallen in love with someone who didn't, you know, have some degree of suffering or pain. You know, that's how we connect sometimes. And I reckon this thing of wanting to do good in the world um, really comes from a very deep um, place, just a very old place. I lost my, my sister Rowena when I was five. I, t I talk about her now. I couldn't for years, I just write songs about her. And I reckon those things that crack us open allow us to connect with people. Um, does anyone else ever have that feeling? They either, ha they either allow us to connect with people or they send us into depression, anxiety, panic attacks, all of that kind of stuff that's so normal. You know, the, the best thing, the best answer for a panic attack for anyone who's ever had one, which apparently is most of the room, they're very common these days, is to go, huh, I think I'm having a panic attack. Say it, speak it. Can you hold my hand? My friend, five days ago, we were in Vietnam. She took me up to the tallest tower. I didn't realize how, how afraid I was of heights until we're going up, my ears are popping in the elevator, and I'm like, gay. And I just said to her, I think I'm really scared. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt better. Anyway, I don't know how we got onto that. No, because I, 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 was, I, I was asking you everything you're saying about connection and I was asking you about what do you do when people are yeah. unkind and people oh. are ungenerous. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I had, a, I had a situation today, guys. Can I be honest with you? Hey, can I, before we go on, um, can you guys do me a little favour? Just a little, because some of you know each other. Is there anyone here who doesn't know anyone in the room? No. Can you do oh, me yes, a favour? Yeah. <laughs> Could you just do me a favour? Often we, we do this at BHB Talks. We've done this, you know, at shows. I just want to make sure that this, our conversation, everything that Dumbo does is about building community, connecting people to each other. And some of you will walk out of this room tonight without having said anything to anyone necessarily. So just take a moment. Let's have a little vulnerability moment. Okay, you with me? Can we do this? Okay, this will connect. So I want you to think for just one second, just take a bit, a bit of a breath in. Okay, and I just want you to think for a second. See, when I was a little kid, I was reading through old diaries today, and I realised I wanted to be Wonder Woman. I really did. <laughs> the simple wish at a balloon. Some of you might have, might have wanted to be doctors, nurses, pharmacists, who knows? I don't know why I'm in the medicine today, but... <laughs> Think for a second about something that you either loved doing as a child or wanted to do as a child. Just think about that for a sec. Has everyone got something? Something that you loved doing as a child. It might have been in nature, it might have been with a dog that you loved taking on a walk. It might have been something you liked eating. You might have wanted to be a singer or Miss World or whatever. Has everyone got something? Okay, now I want you to turn to someone you do not know in your very close vicinity and tell them. <laughs> Say your name and the thing you wanted to be. Should we sing? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that But 
now. But now I see. Yes. 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 Love you. Yep, I can feel the vulnerability hanging over. Come on! Did you hear that voice? <laughs> Hidden talent. That was my wish. Huzzah! Wow! <laughs> Huzzah! Huzzah! You asked me about unkindness. So I had an unkind letter today. It's not often I get them. I get literally thousands of letters every single year. Handwritten letters, beautiful letters, <laughs> beautiful gifts kind people. Sometimes it takes me seven years to reply, but I always try and get there. Really, it does. It's, it, but I, I do, I try and get there. And today I had one where someone had taken something that I'd said as a compliment and assumed the worst. Mm. And um, how do you deal with unkindness? You, you ask, what's my part in it? What's what is my, my part, part in it? it? What could yeah. I have done to communicate or not communicate better? Is there anything I need to apologise for? If so, go ahead. Um, and you respond with kindness, as you know, to the best of your your ability. If anyone says anything unkind about my friend, though, I just punch them. <laughs> <laughs> that segued into my criticism and shying away from it, because it's got to really hurt, especially being in the public eye, as you are and being you. It actually doesn't hurt so much. It hmm. did. It paralysed me. I remember my first Triple J um, album of the week and I was, you know, amazed. So there, there hadn't been many women who had album of the weeks at the time hmm. and I was a 28 year old mum. It was my first album. I was, I was really thrilled to have the support of Triple J. I wasn't um, tough like I thought you had to be if you were going to get played on Triple J. But I was indie and I made the mistake of reading through the criticisms and all those things that I just said to you about myself, you know, I wasn't tough, um, uh, did I fit in, who knew, someone else had written those things, you know, people pick weaknesses and they, <laughs> they write about them. It didn't matter that there were sort of 25 five star reviews, it was the two stars, oh, the crush, head under pillow, <laughs> as Brene would say, just jar of peanut butter day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, crushing. So you learn to get a thick skin to, I, I just don't take criticism from people who are not in the arena anymore. Yeah. I just don't, it's irrelevant, you know, it really is. So the criticism. Do you want to explain that about being in okay. the arena? So there's a guy called Teddy Roosevelt. You might have heard of him, American <laughs> chap. Look, back in 19, 21, I think it was, he gave a famous address in Paris called Citizen of the Republic. Citizen of the Republic is often, often called the man in the arena. And it's a talk that basically it has travelled down in history to us. His 13-year-old son Kermit was in there and I always think, wow, you called your son Kermit. And <laughs> That's what I was thinking. But it was before, you know, Kermit the Frog, it was a fine name. And <laughs> Secondly, you know, this, this, d does anyone know this, this particular piece of work? It basically says, um, uh, I can Google it. Yeah. <laughs> basically says, I think I've actually got it here. Credit does not belong to the man who is not in the arena, who's not marred by blood and sweat and tears, who's not daring greatly and failing greatly. Okay. You know, it does not belong to the critic. It's easy to be a critic much harder to stand up and give it a crack, even though you may fail, but if you do, at least do so daring greatly, so your place in history will not be with those timid and cold souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Um, it's such a great quote that many, many people have written about it over the years, including, as we said before, our, our girl crush, Brene. She wrote a book called Daring Greatly, which I encourage anyone to read. Um, but that had to become the frame of mind. I thought I can either let it squash me, or I can think about the other cool women who are trying to do what I want to do, or the guys who are trying to talk and write songs with heart, or cut in between the rock, you know, the rock which is the stereotype of women at that time, the stereotype of men at that time, and none of us are really stereotyped. 
we're all incredibly, we have different faces. I have identical twins and they have different faces, you know. So we all do. So I had to learn to deal with criticism. I still write songs about thin skin. I, I name my heart business, you know, my business, Big Heart of Business. Um, don't think I didn't know how easy it is to criticise a name like that. My God. Mm -hmm. You know, I write songs called The what Window. What do you mean? <laughs> the Window Chose <laughs> Happiness because... No, The Big Heart of Business was... Well, it's a dangerous topic to mm. go business and heart. They have a relationship. If I hadn't lived it, if I didn't know it, I couldn't name it that. Does that make sense? You know, it's really easy to write people off for having ideas, the kind of ideas that I have. Hmm. But they made sense to me, so I could talk about them. So what's one of the best stories to come out of Big Hearted Business so far? Oh, there's so many incredible stories. There's hmm. so many hundreds and hundreds of stories. Hmm. But here is the story that we get again and again, just that people, basically we teach creative people about business and business people about creativity in ways that make sense. But actually what we do is we teach people who give a shit how to be powerful in the world, how to have influence, how to have self-determination. And that's it, because we believe that's all we can do to make a, a, a positive change in the world. Um, and that old Margaret Mead quote about, you know, don't think that change doesn't come from a small, group of people, in fact, that's all it's ever come from. So, um, just a story that comes back in again and again is people saying, I didn't know, I thought I was alone in this idea. Um, I didn't know there were other people like me who were thinking along the same lines and they're feeling heartened. There's so, you know, people who are writing and saying, I've quit my, like, there's a lot of, at first I was quite terrified by a lot of the, I've quit my day job letters. I'm like, fuck, you better ask them for the job back. <laughs> but I, yeah, many thousands of people now hmm. have um, just a little inkling that maybe something that they do matters. Maybe something that they do help someone else have an idea of business that's a bit more interconnected. So that's it, that's it. How do you galvanise community the way you have? Um, I don't, they galvanise themselves. They really do, if it were up to me, I'd be like, yeah. There's just, the idea is always about the idea. They are the most motivated, you know, I was, like I said, I was shocked by people being into the idea. They organise their own little meetups mm. in every state. Mm. You know, they're the ones who are collaborating on business ideas together and moving in together. You know, I'm waiting for the first BHB baby. <laughs> um, they do it themselves because they're big hearted people who want to be around other big hearted people and they know that, you know, there's more to life than making money, but you still got to make a living. I feel like I'm talking around in circles. I hope there's something oh. that I'm saying that's making sense. Sorry, I didn't hear it. Did <laughs> yeah, you told me. Well, actually, I think that's a, a perfect segue to have questions from you. And what we're always trying to do, understanding that there's no perfect person, including my parents or myself or my children or my partner or anyone in this room, um, is or you're always, it's like steering a ship and you're trying to work with the wind that you have and you're just trying to lean it just this way and you've got an idea of what's over there. And there is so much that was so great about my childhood. There are other parts of being brought up in a strictly religious Catholic home that can be a challenge for anyone. There are parts that are really anchoring, especially when you've had the shattering, you know, the shattering of a family, as many of us have, um, to have a framework um, to anchor down to is really imperative. It's been imperative with us for touring, for example. So we're a family who tour a lot. We take our children with us. Um, we carry the, you know, they're just funny little things that my mum would always do, setting routines. So life is crazy, things happen all the time, as just happened with two of our friends here tonight. We don't know what happened to them, but this is happening to everyone all the time. Um, How dare you? Just about to, no. Um, so, what can we do? Small little things that make sense, you know? Small little things that make sense. So, for example, for us, carrying the same alarm clock for years, carrying the same blanket that my friend stitched for us, um, having fish and chips on a Friday night or so on, you know, little things. Uh, my mother and father are in me all the time, I'm constantly thinking of them. My father's passed on. My mother, her good bits, 
um, far outweighed her other part. So it was very lucky to have a very loving family. But um, do I carry it on? Oh, fuck yeah. Do you? What? Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, how, yeah. Don't segue to me. Yeah, yeah. No, you know it. Yeah. You know it. Absolutely. You, of course. Yeah. I think we we're carry it on. We carry stuff. I just think it's good to um, examine, to live the life exactly. examined so that you filter what you carry. Deeply examined. You know, annoyingly, spectacularly yeah. examined often. I like, I, yeah, yeah, I get frightened of the cobwebby bits that I haven't sort of examined and yeah. they're not filtered. Yeah. That scares the shit out of me. <laughs> but you've told me it's okay. So. It sure is. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. yeah, it has to be. Okay, so are you good at what you do? Yes. You, you know that. Okay, so that's something that you know. At a certain point, you know. Mm. And you know it because people are, not, not, not every show, but if you're letting people know if you're doing your marketing well, people are coming to your shows, for example. If you're not doing your marketing well and no one comes to your shows, there's no surprise there. Often we're tempted to take that personally. But if you're doing it well, people are coming along, they're interested in your idea, then you know, what are you doing? You're solving a problem for someone. So you're doing it well. So firstly, there's the question of, are we doing it well? Are we surprising and delighting? Are we, are we making it enjoyable for people? Yes, okay, so that's a currency. That feels good, that connection back and forth. So that's one form of inspiration. What's another form of inspiration when the money's not coming in? Wanting to do something good in the world. Wanting to have a higher purpose, okay? What's another form of inspiration? Desperation. You know, absolute desperation. Not having enough money to pay for very basic things. It makes you smart quickly. Why is there such an incredibly high atrophy rate in the arts? Because most people can't be stuffed going through the process. It is, and, and not just arts, in business, in social enterprise. Why, for all entrepreneurs, is there such a high drop-off rate? Because it's hard. It is hard. Even if you're bankrolled, it's a challenge. You know, so what galvanised me... Can I just say, that is the misconception, that yeah. if you're bankrolled, you're going to do shit. It's just not true. If you're bankrolled, you're going to go on holidays. It's true. Like, people think money's the reason that I'm being held back or I can't do it. It's just, it's no. so not true. Yeah, exactly. And I was absolutely uh, determined to make my living as an artist. I was determined to prove a point. Why can't we do it here in Australia? <laughs> when I could do it in Canada or Europe or Berlin or so on, when it's normalised, why not? I hope this is an archaic conversation that's looked back on in 20 years. Like, oh, really? Like, I'm reading Monkey Grip at the moment. You know that Helen Garner book? And the relationships between, oh, that's not that one, the other one. Anyway, <laughs> the relationships between men and women, you know, this is an amazing book, but you sort of read it and you go, oh, that, that's a relationship that's, I would never put up with that, you know, from a guy now, me personally. Um, so we know that times change and I hope this conversation too changes. So how do you do it when the money's not there? I mean, I remember one particular show, from all accounts on the outside, we looked like we were making money, we were winning awards, we had a record contract, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> but we dropped 26K on a sold out tour around Australia. Why? Oh, taking an 11 piece band. <laughs> When you're playing 20, 200 people capacity, maybe not so smart. Um, so you keep the faith and you, you, you just do because there's something in you that suspects that there's something useful. I don't know, we don't know many of you very well, but here's the truth. There might be something that someone says to you tonight or one of us said to you tonight that changes your life a little bit for the better. That's it. That's the currency that kept me going. That was it the thought that it would be normalised, this thing we were trying to do. Very, very powerful. Do you know what else I think is powerful? Hanging out with good people. That's it. Hugely so. So having that 11 piece pen <laughs> was necessary. Amazing, I can't, but I sort of, it's sort of the water, I'm sorry, it's, so, uh, it's the water that I swim in and it's such an obvious thing that, you know, I should have said, but what, what keeps us yeah. invigorated, you know? The stories of our friends who are doing very well, making a difference, the company that we keep. But also being able to be your best self around the people you spend the most of your time with. Yeah. Because if you're with people that pull you down and oh people God. that remind you of like your shame corners. I can't tell you how many people that, that both of us have had who, who 
have tried to do that in our yeah. lives. Yeah, we've done some discards, some see you laters. You got yeah. to. Just to. Yeah. yeah. Success. Okay, so um, we ask ourselves, what is our idea of success? My idea of success has changed enormously around the, over the years. You heard me today define a few different ideas of what I thought success was. When I was young, I thought it would be somehow magically bringing my sister back and curing her. Mm. I thought it would be being thin. I thought it would be a whole lot of different things. So I just am open with you about this because I know I'm not alone in it. It's just these basic things that are not articulated, but we have a notion of success that's based upon them. So you're always feeling like a failure. Again, there's a currency in it but you've got to catch it because it's dangerous. Then my idea of success became, I want to run my own business. I want some choice in my life. I don't want to be working these jobs where I have no choice for the rest of my life. So I started to have an inkling of success. Then I wanted to simply make enough money to be able to keep making more music. And again, an idea of, you know, a sense of success came to me fleetingly, fleetingly. So my relationship with success is very much um, fluid, very, very fluid. Um, but I like to make it quite simple. Did I wake up this morning? I did. <laughs> Fucking bravo me. <laughs> you know? And I think we make ourselves as successful as we want to be. Um, it is not over there, though. It's, it's so not over there. It's right here, right now, in this very second.